Welcome to the Critical Christian Podcast. We're your hosts, Dan and Justin, where we ask critical questions about the Bible and provide questionable answers. Dan, uh, this week we're going to be in Genesis 21. Where did we leave off from last week? Uh, I believe last week we did Genesis 20. I <laughs> That's a fairly <laughs> safe conclusion. Dan, can you recap us with where we left off from chapter 20? Uh, yeah, we were talking about Abimelech and Abraham. And from what I remember, it was a story very similar to when Abraham met up with... The Pharaoh? The Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was so similar that uh, we thought maybe it was just a retelling. Sure, like a doublet. Right. Right, yeah. Two oral traditions that were different enough that they became separate traditions. Right. Yeah. I think we have a similar doublet coming up here in 21 with Hagar in the desert. You know, it's funny you should say that because I was reading this chapter and I thought, mm -hmm. hey, wait, didn't I already read this? Right. Yeah. I mean, it really feels as you're reading it like you get in deja vu. Dan, can you read 21, 1 through 7? And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah, as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, when he was eight years old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. All right. Um, so when I first started um, reading this, and it started to bring up the matter of her laughing again. Yeah. This, I I thought to myself, wow, you know, this story just sounds like a continuation of where we left off mm -hmm. with Abraham. Right. Um, minus the, uh, you know, the interlude with Abimelech. Mm -hmm. So I just out of curiosity, I, I stuck this story at the end of the previous narrative where the three angels come and provide the promise. And sure enough, it reads right through perfectly as if this was once a co cohesive narrative. And it's almost like they broke it in half and stuck a bunch of stuff in there just to kind of explain things. There were narratives they they felt like they needed to, to stick in somewhere, like the narrative of Sodom, the narrative of Lot and his descendants, before they moved on with the Abraham narrative, mm -hmm. right? And so... My mind was initially taken back to, I don't know if you've ever read the Epic of Gilgamesh. We've brought it up a couple of times. Actually, yes, I have. Which version did you read? The one that's English. Right. Um, I, I asked that question because there, there's roughly 15 versions of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, the problem is that the Epic of Gilgamesh was being edited for you know 2,000 years. And so the earliest versions, there's only like, like eight tablets worth of text, and it's a pretty cohesive story with not a lot of interludes and not a lot of extra detail that doesn't seem like it serves a purpose to the story. But when you get, say, into the 8th century and the 7th century, and we read the Assyrian versions of the Epic of Gilgamesh, there's a ton of added detail. There's like a, um, a roughly uh, 10 times the number of lines of text in that version as the original Old Babylonian version. So those were added not by the original author, which means they should not be there. These, these like meta narratives in the ancient world, they were so well known and they were so revered uh, from one generation to another, that as relevant information came, uh, relevant stories came to to be important to a particular people culture, they would stuff that 
story into a larger meta narrative. So, for example, there's a story about, you know, Gilgamesh and Enkidu going to the cedar forest of Lebanon to cut down one of the, of the cedars of, uh, of God. So that story doesn't exist in all of the Gilgamesh epics. That actually comes later. It's, it's a, a short story that gets stuffed into the Gilgamesh epic as part of, of an, ex, a, an explainer, just like there's a portion of the Gilgamesh epic that it explains death, and there's a portion of the Gilgamesh epic that explains why or, or why not human beings can't live forever. There's, there's lots of explainers within the Epic of Gilgamesh because the goal of the meta narrative is to allow it to speak to all of the issues that people would have questions about. Genesis, I, I feel, is a lot like a meta narrative, uh, an overarching narrative, kind of like the Epic of Gilgamesh. And these were stories that people believed to be true. But in order to make it a cohesive storyline, they had to stuff these smaller stories into the larger narrative because what do you do when you pass down a narrative? You try to pass down the bulk of the story as much as you can remember to your children. I guess what I'm suggesting is that the patriarch narratives of Genesis were uh, so large and so widespread that they lent themselves easily to being treated as though they were a definitive source of information. And so when you go to add new information to the traditional text, to the text that gives your nation identity, you, of course, you stuff it into the existing narrative that explains your people group. Just like if you have... Um, a spending bill, you, you have to pass a spending bill through Congress. It's got a deadline of July. It, it's a must-pass bill or the government shuts down. What do they do? They stuff all kinds of pork into it. They stuff all kinds of stuff that has nothing to do with budgeting into that bill just because they know it has to pass, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They might fight over it, and some stuff might be removed and re-added and whatnot, but that's the way it, it's treated. They use this necessary must-have item, and then they stuff it with all sorts of smaller items that they feel need to be included. And I think the patriarchal narratives, just like Gilgamesh, is a bit like that. We have this uh, overarching narrative that is a good explanation and a good history for a people group. But over the course of time, people want to narrative stuff that narrative with extra information that may not have been relevant to the original audience, but they feel like is relevant to them now. And that's why I feel like so much of this narrative that we've had with Abraham has like these side stories. Even though you could actually cut all those side stories out and the Abraham narrative re reads much cleaner. Uh, you pointed out that Isaac means he laughs. Is there any relevance to this? I mean, yeah, especially since uh, last time we met uh, Abraham and Sarah, I believe that uh, she had said what she laughed, and then she's like, "No, I didn't laugh." And then Abraham is like, "Oh no, you did laugh." And it's just this weird back and forth where they were, I don't know, almost making fun of Sarah. You know? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of looks like Sarah got called out by Yahweh himself, like to her face. Right. For don't laugh at God, first of all, I guess is the lesson of the story there. But yeah. you're right. I think that the naming of Isaac, um, I think the story leading up to the three angels or leading up from the three angels, where they laughed, where she laughed. Mm -hmm. And then even here where there's lots of mention of laughing again. I think these are all narrative explainers for the naming of Isaac. Because it's an odd name to give somebody, especially in a time period where people had significant names mm -hmm. that tended to function like their role in the narrative, like Abraham, the father of many. Isaac seems to be one of the first names in the early narratives where the, the name of the individual doesn't actually mm -hmm. match their function in the story. So it's more believable. 
I think it lends itself to being more believable. Do you think that maybe this is uh, a subtle jab at his wife? <laughs> maybe. Because he did call her out in front of Yahweh. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal, right? He doesn't seem to be above letting seems, his wife take a fall. Right. Seems a little petty. He he does. And we're, we're going to see a little bit more of that, actually, here in a minute. Um. Anyways, let's move on. I think this lends credence to the idea that Sarah was supernaturally returned to her youth. Because I don't believe women can nurse children after a certain age. And certainly not after a hundred. You know, last week, as we floated the theory that uh, according to the Jewish rabbis, when the angels visited, uh, her youthfulness was restored. And in fact, maybe not just for her youthfulness in function so she could bear a child, but also her beauty. And I mean, that certainly, mm-hmm. you know, it sounds far-fetched, but it certainly would make sense considering, mm-hmm. you know, everybody was trying to... Have a meeting with her. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, the, the pharaoh was trying to get with her, right? And yeah. then uh, Abimelech tried to get with her. Are we to assume that she was the most attractive senior citizen on the planet? It, it could definitely um, fit the story that maybe God did restore her youthfulness and her beauty in order for her to procreate. Mm-hmm. And which is why now she can nurse Isaac. Right. Yeah, because that's not something you can do at 90. It just right. isn't. Right. Not a thing. Um, I wrote that it seems a bit odd that the narrator needs to reassure the reader that Sarah was the mother of the child, especially since the chapter starts with the fact that the promise of God to her and Abraham was thus being fulfilled. You know, I don't know if that's odd anymore, considering mm-hmm. it feels like, at least back in that day, a lot of the children were like, uh, from well, it didn't really matter who bore the child. Uh, that's a very good point. How often does it say that so and so had a child, but doesn't always list? Not always, but doesn't always list the wife. Mm-hmm. Um, or it'll list a maid servant or a concubine. Here, it's, I think maybe the narrator is taking an extra, uh, extra sort, uh, extra measure of caution and just stating flat out that Isaac was indeed born of Sarah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although what what that serves the reader, I don't know yet. Are they under the impression that the reader is confused about whose child it is? Well, I mean, it's possible. I mean, we just spoke about uh, Hagrid. Hagar. <laughs> we're we're going to speak about her again. Yeah. So it's possible they were like, oh, I bet it was with another concubine. Right. You know, so just hammer the point in there, you know? Right. That this is mir- miraculous. Yeah, that's a good point. It, especially with the patriarchs and uh, like the the very important figures of the Old Testament. It's such a common trope for the Old Testament to point out that their parents couldn't conceive. The woman was barren. So their birth was always miraculous. Mm-hmm. Think of Samson, uh, Samuel... I mean, there's probably more that I can't think of at the moment. Obviously, Sarah. So, yeah, I mean, maybe this is the narrator just, again, re-emphasizing the fact that this is a miraculous birth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, Dan, in 7, it says, She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Mm-hmm. And... You pointed this out before, and until you pointed it out, I, these weren't things that I noticed, but Sarah is, talks about herself in third person again, which, mm. as I was reading it, sounded strange. Uh, this is maybe the one instance where I was, I, I read it a couple times, I thought, well, maybe it could make a little bit of sense because Sarah is talking about somebody else mm. speaking about them. Right. But it's still, it's such a weird way to word a sentence. You know what I mean? I do. Um, It still feels like the sentence was somehow contrived or Mm -hmm. part of another narrative, and they had to kind of stuff it in here and make it make sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's move on to the departure of Hagar and Ishmael. And this is where things are going to get decidedly uh, spicy. All right, Dan, can you read 8 through 13 for us? 
So the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed, seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. That's kind of nice there that he's, you know, going to still do something with Ishmael, not just cast him aside, right? Yeah, so nice. So. I like how God is like, just just nod your head. Right. Just nod your head. <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a lot that can be said here uh, to your to your comment there about just nodding your head. I <laughs> I personally found it strange reading the story that God never reprimanded Sarah for her bad behavior. But the only way I can make sense of it is if somehow this helped serve God's plan. Like, mm-hmm. no, 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 trust me, it's better this way. Although, I mean, he still could have been like, Sarah, don't be, you know, yeah, don't be. So mean. Exactly. Why you gotta be so nasty? Especially, she, she didn't do anything wrong. I mean, there was one point in the beginning when she first got pregnant that she kind of um, got a little um, too big for her britches <laughs> and wore out, wore out her welcome there. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, other than that, we don't know that she's done anything wrong in this story. And definitely, there's nothing that we can blame Ishma for. Why would he be getting punished? Right. But... Anyways, I, I, in the very first um, verse here, 21.9, it says, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian. I like how they pointed out the Egyptian. They mm. never want to forget that. <laughs> whom she had born to Abraham scoffing. Uh, I thought that was odd to me uh, for a couple reasons. One, because it doesn't make sense in the story at all. It, unless we assume that um, maybe when... Ishmael was uh, roughly the same age. He never got the same treatment. I can see where he might scoff at his uh, brother. However, um, based on what we know about Abraham, that seems unlikely. Abraham seems to want to take care of Ishmael throughout the story so far. But um, I also found interesting there is a, a lot of variance in how this gets translated, it turns out that probably a better translation, and this is going to open up a can of worms, is that Isaac um, wasn't being scoffed at by Ishmael. Ishmael was playing with Isaac, not scoffing at Isaac. Mm. And this is actually seen as well in the Greek text of the Old Testament. So in the Septuagint, it translated as playing as well. Now, one would ask, what in the world is a 14-year-old boy playing with a very young, what, three-year-old Isaac? You weaned a child Mm. uh, uh, roughly around age three at that time. What in the world would they be playing? Now, here's my theory. I um, I don't think Ishmael was playing with Isaac at 14. I think he was playing with Isaac at probably four or five. I think they were closer in age than the narrative has led us to believe. And I think that becomes very clear when they go out into the desert. It is a bit of a difference, but when we read the rest of this narrative, it really reads as though um, Ishmael is much younger. And in fact, it, it almost reads to me like this part of the narrative used to be part of the chapter 16 narrative where they get uh, go out to the desert and the Lord meets them out there. Hmm. Um, let's read through the, the rest of this narrative and then we'll go through the, the comments. Okay. Dan, can you read through? So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. 
Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And when the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, Let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Feel not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Yeah, if you read that last bit slow enough, it sounds really weird. <laughs> <laughs> his mother took a wife. <laughs> That's how I had read it. <laughs> you don't hear that in Genesis too often. So here, you know, specifically, um, it says they rose in the morning and he put it on her shoulder. But again, this is a, a goofy translation. This is not a good translation. What it should be translated as is he placed... Ishmael on her shoulders, it really says, and then he handed the water to Ishmael. So Ishmael is small enough in in the Hebrew text here that he can be placed on the shoulders of his mother. And then that fits as well with the rest of the story because they go out into the desert, and once they finish the water, it is Ishmael who is on the edge of death. But if we are to believe that he's 16 years old, yeah. how is he not, in the prime of his life, how is he not uh, the one that's in good health and his mother not the one that's on the edge of... And also, he'd probably be crushing her. Right? Yeah. Well, first of all, he'd be crushing her. But, I mean, second of all, if you imagine you're 16 years old, you're in the desert with your mother. Let's assume, based on everything we know about Hagar, she loves her son and she wants to protect him. Let's assume that they they at least drank the water evenly. So they're both equally as, you know, hydrated or dehydrated. Mm -hmm. I have to assume that Ishmael's mom would have been the one that would be succumbing to the heat, not Ishmael, if Ishmael is in the prime of his life at 16. That makes sense. But if Ishmael is just... Uh, you know, a couple years older than Isaac. He's still a, a young boy, not a lad, a very young boy at this stage. Well, yeah, of course he's going to succumb to the, the desert heat. You know, it's it's going to be virtually unbearable for him. So anyways, the story goes on and she places him under a bush. Well, how do you place a 16-year-old <laughs> boy under a bush? I mean, presumably he doesn't weigh much. She's really strong and the bush is gigantic. Like how, yeah, how is that going to play out? And then when God visits her, he commands her to lift up the boy and hold him with your hand. With one hand. Yeah. I mean, it just, the, the whole narrative to me reads, especially if you, if you get rid of some of the goofy English translations, the narrative to me reads as though he is still a little boy, and this is probably part of the Genesis 16 narrative that at some point became a disconnected story. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where the narrative started out as the same part of the same story, but the the stories, as they migrated to different territories, they changed enough right. that one story became two separate stories because details get mixed up. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the nature of oral traditions. And that's the hard part about Genesis. That's why there's so many in Genesis and Exodus, there's so many uh, doublets. Right, yeah. Because they're trying to reconcile the, with the north and the south. They're trying to form a meta narrative that includes everybody's uh, foundational stories. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means you have double stories that probably a word of the same story at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, all, all that to, uh, just to explain the age situation. But needless to say, 
I'm not the first person to notice the fact that um, Ishmael was placed on the shoulders of his mother, according to the original language. Um, that seems to be a, a common enough translation. At yeah. least it was at some point before English translators tried to smooth it out. Uh, um, however, this uh, may be evidence that Abraham and not Sarah was actually the sterile one. If um, mm. we assume Abraham had been having a lot of uh, m meetings. Conjugal visits. That's <laughs> with the concubines and not making it any children, right? it's probably, I mean, it's either all of their fault, all of his concubines are sterile, or, or, or it's him. Right. So. Yeah, I, I have a sneaky suspicion you're right, and that he's shooting blanks. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because, um, you know, the, the miraculous one is, uh, you know, making Sarah mm -hmm. uh, whatever. But it seems like maybe... Uh, God uh, made him not sterile, and then made it so Sarah could nurse. So two miracles right there. Oh, oh, that's a really good idea. So the miracle wasn't just that Sarah was renewed, right. but Abraham was renewed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, and w because we only have speculation to go on, does this make any amount of sense with the rite of circumcision? God was what renewing his, was. you know his potency oh you know the the sign of the circumcision is perhaps a symbol of god you know d divine healing i know you mentioned <laughs> that before actually yeah that that was like one of the uh reasons for circumcision yeah yeah it seems if if the circumcision means anything i feel like it has to be connected to the command for him to bear children Right, mm. or else, what in the world's the point of cutting your foreskin off? Right, just makes no sense. Let's let's look at fourteen. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He took bread, a skin of water, and putting the child on her shoulders, he gave it and the boy to Hagar, and sent her on her way. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And before I went back to read this a couple times. This is about where I wanted to punch Abraham in the face. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it sounds like he's being nice, but he obviously has to know he's kind of sending uh, at least his child to his death, right? Yeah. It's, it says wilderness in the New King James Version, which, which is what we're reading. Mm. But that is the desert. Midbar, Hebrew for desert. That is the desert. So, and as we see, guess what? It's hot. They almost die out there. Right. I don't know how big the skin of water was, but it wasn't big enough for two people. Right. Now, let's, if we, again, go back to the theory that um, Ishmael was young, mm -hmm. young enough to play with Isaac. Sending one large skin of water makes more sense. But if he's 16, <laughs> would you not also give him right. an additional skin of water? Why, why would you want uh, a boy in his prime to split a skin of water with his mother, sending him into the desert when you're the wealthiest man in the desert? Who's got more money than Abraham right now? Yeah. King Abimelech. Abimelech's oh, the only person go. we've there. met so far with more money and wealth than Abraham. Right. Abraham's an idiot. Who in the world would... You wouldn't send your, your, your worst... You got into a fight with your your ex-best friend and you can't see his face without wanting to punch him in the face, you still wouldn't send him into the desert with no water. Okay, so they've got one skin, one measly skin of water. He's got probably hundreds of servants, dozens and dozens of cattle and sheep and goats. Could he have not sent them into the wilderness with a couple pieces of livestock, saddled a donkey, with provisions that could last them long enough to journey to a safe place, mm -hmm. but a a loaf of bread, that, and that's what it says. It doesn't say some bread mm -hmm. or an unknown quantity of bread. It says a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so anyways, but nevertheless, this is not adequate provisions. Right. And um, it's... It, 
it it's even more bananas because there were rules, as you said, there were laws in place for what to do when you discharged uh, a wife or a concubine or somebody in really? who had borne you children. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot of laws. Uh, we're going to look at just a couple of the laws. The most um, contemporaneous laws came from Hammurabi. There's four of them in particular we probably want to look at. Uh, this is Law 137. If a man wished to separate from a woman who has borne him children or from his wife who has borne him children, then he shall give that wife her dowry and part of the unfruct of, I'm sorry, part, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just try that again. And part of the, ooze of, you know what? We're going to look this All word right. up. There's no way I'm going to pronounce this correctly. And it's this word is not from this century. <laughs> we shouldn't even be attempting to read it. Okay, so let's go back. If a man wished to separate from a woman who has borne him children, or from his wife who has borne him children, then he shall give that wife her dowry and a part of the gleanings of the field, the garden, and property so that she can rear the children. So we'll pause right there. So first of all, the goal of this law was to provide the woman, whether it was a wife or a concubine or a maidservant, with enough that the the raising of the children can be accomplished. So uh, we'll move on. When she has brought up her children, a portion of all that is given to the children equal to that of one son shall be given to her. She may then marry the man of her heart. So here, there are provisions made in the the Code of Hammurabi to take care of the woman and the child until the child is of age. Law 138 says, If a man wishes to separate from his wife, who has borne him no children, he shall give her the amount of her purchase money, that's the bride price, and the dowry which she brought from her father's house and let her go. So in Law 138, a woman who's not born children to a man, even if she leaves the union without a child, she still gets at least her purchase price back. Mm -hmm. We have to assume that the maidservant, Hagar, had a purchase price when mm -hmm. she was purchased as a maidservant from Egypt. Mm -hmm. There's no mention of her getting that purchase price back. Right. Right. Hammurabi 146, if a man take a wife and she give this man a maidservant as wife, so now we're talking about what happened with Sarah and Hagar, and she bear him children, and then this maid assume equality with the wife because she has borne him children, her master shall not sell her for money, but he may keep her as a slave, reckoning her among the maidservants. So there's something happening here that's interesting where if a maidservant has a child and that maidservant gets kind of full of herself because she born a child to the master and she now thinks that she's equal, mm -hmm. even though she, she has this newfound sense of self-worth and it may be problematic for her, the law is stating you can't just get rid of her. You can't just go sell her. You know what I mean? Like you still ha she ha still has to be taken care of. Um, the only way in which you would get rid of the slave woman is, it says in Law 147, if she has not borne him any children, then her mistress may sell her for money. So if Hagar had not borne any children to Abraham, it would be very customary for her to be sold off, if that's what Sarah wanted to do. But since she did have children with Abraham, she deserved special treatment. Mm-hmm. The Hittite laws, uh, law 27, if a man take a wife and carries her to his house, he takes her dowry with her. If the woman dies, they turn her property uh, into the property of a man or of the man. And the man also receives her dowry. But if she dies in the house of her father and there are children, the man will not receive uh, her dowry. All right, what's Hittite? The, uh, the Hittite territory is Anatolia, basically modern Turkey. Uh, so this was north of Palestine, um, uh, uh, right below the Black Sea on the northeast portion of the Mediterranean. Um, 
so here this this Hittite law dealing with the dowry is basically just stating, hey, if a woman leaves her husband, so she's in her father's house now, doesn't say if if she left him or if he sent her away. Mm-hmm. That seems to be irrelevant for this law. It just says if she's living apart from her husband, so they broke up. If she has children, then she gets her her dowry back, right? Um, I would imagine that if there's a slave girl, there was a treatment for that as well. You would get your purchase price back, just like we saw in the Code of Hammurabi. Hittite Law 31, if a free man and a slave girl are lovers and they cohabitate, he takes her for his wife and they find uh, and they found a family together and have children but subsequently either as a quarrel or they reach a friendly agreement they break up so this is very similar to what happened with Abraham and Hagar mm-hmm. they uh, break up the family the man receives the children but the woman receives one child so here this is kind of a strange the woman gets at least one child assuming here it's going to be a son so that she has somebody to take care of her in her old age. Because again, she is deserving of at least some kind of treatment. And we see with Hagar, this is the only thing that Hagar actually gets Mm -hmm. when she splits is her son. Mm -hmm. That's it. No dowry, no purchase. She probably didn't didn't have a dowry. She was a slave. But she at least was bought with some sort of a purchase price, didn't get that back. Mm -hmm. Um. There's an interesting law from the Greco-Roman culture. The Gortine laws were uh, roughly, uh, you know, 5th and 6th century BCE. So we're talking about 1,500 years after Abraham. But um, the, these laws are, are probably much older. It's just a matter of when they were actually codified. Basically, in Greco-Roman culture, it was expected that if you were a divorcee, and you had a child, if you couldn't bring that child up, there were no provisions for you or for the child, it was acceptable to let it die in, you know, in the heat of the desert. Mm -hmm. But even with this law, there's an expectation that you should be taken care of because you've had a child, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, The laws, uh, Eshnuna 59, these are really old laws. If a man divorces his wife after having made her bear children and takes another wife, he shall be driven from his house and from whatever he owns and may go after him who will accept it. Um, so this is really interesting. If you have children with a woman here in the uh, ancient Eshnuna laws, you're actually not allowed to take another wife. Hmm. Now, this does not seem to be a common law in the ancient world. So anyways, all that to say, the, in the ancient world, it was at least customary to provide the mother of your child and that child with some kind of provision. But it's hard to tell. You know what I mean? Is it possible that back then um, you just self-governed? Yes, that's exactly what happened with the nomadic tribes. It was the head of the tribe, um, and sometimes if it was large enough, tribal elders that would dispense justice. And we saw that when Moses went into the wilderness after the Exodus event. He had to appoint judges to manage all the quarrels of the people. Mm -hmm. Abraham, most likely, since he was a a nomadic tribesman, didn't have to submit himself to any of these uh, the laws of the neighboring mm. uh, cities is just that uh, I'm pointing out that you know the custom of mm. the time. It there was kind of a widespread recognition that these women who born children deserved some kind of provision, and Abraham, the the richest man in the land, presumably gave none, absolutely none. And he almost his his own fruit of his loins almost died. The story is heartbreaking. It really is. And it, the part that frustrates me the most is that it's all freaking preventable. Every bit of what happened in the desert was preventable. There's no reason why Abraham could not have given her a very very large portion to to sustain her till she could find something better. There's so much frustration with this whole passage because you know again I just. I feel like Ishmael is probably in this story the same age as my own son. So when I read it, I put my son into the story, and it 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 makes me like 
you know. I, I, I get it. I think my cat is about three. Mm. Fact, the fact remains, <laughs> my if I had to rate Abraham as a father up to this point, he's not getting an A. Mm. He's just not. He's done a crummy job, and up to now, I have nothing but empathy for Ishmael. And, um, you know, if I didn't know how the rest of the story turned out, mm-hmm. uh, I'd, this would be a very infuriating story. Mm-hmm. In 19, it says, Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water, and she gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. Ironic that she sat a bow shot away from him as he was dying, being that he would soon become an archer. (laughs) He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt, which of course you would. Why wouldn't you? Now, first of all, Beersheba uh, just means uh, seven wells. So first of all, they're in the desert. Yeah. Um, They're dying of thirst. Uh Uh-huh. Um, here's wh- where the story falls apart for me in terms of there's some plot holes that we need to address. First of all, uh, the desert that they're in is named uh, Seven Wells. Okay. Now, I'm assuming at this point that this is an anachronism and that the time the story was told, there mm-hmm. were seven wells. But at the time that Hagar was in the desert, there were not seven wells. Nevertheless, oh, okay. there was at least one well and she never saw the well. She nearly died. Uh, it's a miraculous well. It wasn't there until God made it, right? That's a. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful interpretation. I didn't consider that until you said it. <laughs> okay. It's certainly possible that it's a, a miraculous well, that it wasn't there before. It's only there because God made it to be there. I like that. Because um, otherwise, she's blind. Right. There's a well right near her mm-hmm. with an eye shot. Right. First of all, she set her son down within bow shot. So she's moving around. She's she's not like sitting in one place. She had to have seen a well if there was a well out there. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to side with you on that one because I like Hagar and I I don't (laughs) want her to be a villain in the story and Mm. be so obtuse that she did not see a well right in front of her. Right. Oh boy. So you almost wonder if that was the narrator's uh, point. Right. You know, to show, hey, you're not that bright. Right. (laughs) The narrator is just digging on Hagar. Mm. You know, it's possible. It's a funny story because, like, it looks like there's some parts that were intentional. For example, as we mentioned, you know, when she thought he was going to die, she separated her from him about a bow shot away, which irony of ironies, a couple of verses later, we learn that he becomes a great archer. Obviously that, you know, that was put into the story for a reason, right. right? Maybe foreshadowing. I don't know. So like parts of the story seem to me like it was thought out, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but then there's some parts like, how did she not see the well where I'm like, that seems like a plot hole to me. But it makes sense, like you said, if it was a mar- miraculous well. I could, I could live with that explanation. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's, let's end on the covenant with Abimelech. Let's read 22 through 32. All right. Can you grab that? I can. And it came to pass at the time that Abimelech and Pekol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring, or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do me in the land in which you have dealt. And Abraham said, I will swear. Then Abraham rebuked Abimelech, because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor had I heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech. And the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? 
And he said, You will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand, that they may be my witness that I have dug this well. Therefore he called that place Beersheba, because of the two of them swore an oath there. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Pekel, 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 something, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. Very good. So maybe one of the seven wells in Beersheba was the one that Abraham dug. Now, here's the other thing. Um, at the time that Abraham's having this standoff uh-huh. uh, with the wells in Beersheba, uh, are we to assume that Ishmael and his mother Hagar are out there as well? And what What is Abraham doing in the wilderness of <laughs> right? Beersheba? Did he reconnect? Did he like go out to see if his son was okay? Right. And maybe that's why he's digging a well out there. Maybe he's a good father he's like you know they need to dig their own well and he's still just a boy and hagar can't dig a well mm-hmm. it really just feels like it's a disconnected story to me yeah yeah i agree with you actually on that one um this part of the abimelech narrative really seems like it could have been attached to the previous abimelech narrative oh, sorry. To me, the only thing it really does is it explains the name of Beersheba. Well, there's there's two uh, really important landmarkers here. I don't know if you picked okay. up on it. Um, so a lot of the ancient wells were named and tagged with the ancestor who dug the well. So when you live in a land uh, where there is no fresh water and you dig a well, it's a very monumental undertaking. And you, you would commemorate that well. So like the well of Jacob was still known in the time of Jesus. Um, and so, and I've been to uh, third world countries where mission agencies have come in and dug wells. And you, you put a name on the well to commemorate when it was dug and who, you know who, who dug it, that kind of thing. What a cool connection it would have been if Abraham's well was the one that provided life for Ishmael. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, I think this does explain. I, I bet there was a well during the time of writing that was dedicated to Abraham. And I bet this was the origin story for how that well got its name, how it's got its identification. I think the nature of this story leads, to, leads me to conclude that it was probably a real event because otherwise... If this if this story is to explain the naming of Abraham's well, this makes no sense. This is not the type of story you would want to pass down about your forefather, and and the what led up to you know the naming of this great well or how this well came to be. You would have you would make up a much better story. You know what I mean? Um, nevertheless, I couldn't. You know, and this is a t- side tangent. The other landmark in here, yeah, it says Abraham planted a tamarisk tree right. in Beersheba. And of course, we already talked, and we're not going to do it again, about the sacred nature of trees mm-hmm. in the Old Testament. And I have to assume that when this story was passed down and penned hundreds of years uh, later, this tree was still standing, mm-hmm. which of course is why it made it into the story. Mm-hmm. There must be a very large old tamarisk tree in Beersheba. And it says, And there he called on the name of the Lord. There being where the tree was planted. Because, of course, trees are uh, a symbol of, of magic and divinity. So here it seems Abraham um, might have a, l- a little bit of um, foreign religion in him. 